on Rumble. Okay, so let me bring you up here. Gary, um, you had a wonderful uh, interview a couple of days ago. And since that interview, my email uh, box blew up, uh, at least uh, 50 emails or so, asking me to say, JC, get Carrie back on the screen here because we're a little bit confused. She couldn't get her points across here. There was a lot of confusion in that last video. Let me bring that up for the audience members here. It was your interview uh, with Mike Gill, uh, hosted here uh, by the Patriot Underground uh, Rumble channel. Uh, there was a lot of information in there, but there was a lot of heat. And to some extent, I understand why, why um, where Mike is coming from and all of this. To some extent, you and I have shared some of the same frustrations as to why the hell this is taking so long, what the hell the White Hats are doing. But at the same time, it feels like in this conversation that perhaps Mike was missing part of the overarching story and all of that. So there's a couple of points of contention. Uh, people were asking me to ask you about three things or four things here. So let's go through them one by one and uh, see if we can bring some clarity to all of that. So one, one of the points here was Mike Flynn. So General Flynn, oh, sorry, Flynn, what's his story on this? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? We still have confusion over the last um, episode. Where do we stand today with Flynn is he a double agent? Is he a Fed, as Mike was talking about? Or is he at the last minute here still reporting to the White Hats and perhaps also Trump directly? I'll give you some time here to put that into context for the audience. Okay. Uh, well, I, you know, I am going to have to repeat myself to some degree, as I did on the, the show. And I've been talking about this for a while. But I will say that, uh, you know, Mike Flynn, from what I understand, has been working in um, military intelligence, I guess, uh, and also in various roles. Some say CIA, some perhaps, like Mike, say FBI, although I think he's the first one to actually call Flynn someone who works with the FBI. Um, there is, I hate to bring this up right this minute, but there's a, an interviewer, um, I don't know what you want to call him, an investigator, a person who initially interviewed Mike Gill, who's just come forward recently with some contentious issues that he has with Mike that seem to reflect on this strange relationship that Mike has. Uh, and I clarify that which Mike I'm talking about, because Mike Gill has right. with the FBI, as well as whether, you know, General Flynn is FBI. I mean, these these ideas that people are with certain agencies on a secret basis. Um, personally, I don't know the fact, okay? Uh, I do know what Juan has alluded to. I know there was a conversation between Mike Gill, Nino, and Juan in which Mike Gill was firing questions at Juan, who is always one, if you know, <laughs> uh, to go into long explanations rather than to answer yes, no. So that might be part of the problem because when he began to answer Mike Gill, Mike thought he was done, <laughs> you know, with one sentence. And that is, would be an extremely rare incidence with Juan Osavin, right. who, as I say, likes to go into long explanations. Juan has talked about Mike Gill, uh, not Mike Gill, Juan has talked about General Flynn over the years that he's done broadcasts, he's alluded to uh, Flynn on and off. He's basically said that he um, he thinks he's a good guy. He's a white hat. He trusts him, so on, so. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is always that gray area where General Flynn appears to be um, something of a target for um, maybe clandestine operations on both sides of the street and uh, and on who he's working for at any given time, I don't pretend to know. I can say my understanding is that in terms of the white hat, hat, the white hat pecking order, that it's important to understand that in terms of the military industrial complex, Trump dissolved the corporation while he mm -hmm. was still in office yeah. and he put back into place what's called the Republic. He is CIC, commander in chief of the Republic. And as it happens, he's also president. He's still president and he never conceded the Biden show win, as I call him. So it's, you know, when you're calling people out and you wanna know their roles, 
when you don't even know who is actually our, our official president, and you don't know that we don't have a corporation of the United States anymore, we have a republic, then you aren't even going to be able to kind of find your footing anywhere. So mm -hmm. I think Jan Halper Hayes recently came out, and this is, you know, a couple months ago. She's on the scene quite a bit now, but initially came forward on an English TV show stating unequivocally that Trump was the commander in chief, that he dissolved the corporation and he put in place the Republic be, uh, before he left office. And this also basically coincides with information Juan had given over the years saying that, uh, that we had uh, a corporation. Okay. That up, up until a certain point, we had a corporation that was dissolved and that he put in place the Republic. When he did so, according to Juan, in March of 2021, after Biden was sworn in, the military took another look at the situation. They decided that Biden had not actually qualified to be commander in chief and probably not president either. But what they did do is they did a ceremony to reinstate Trump as commander in chief. And at that point, Trump had what we call, you will. Interesting. Uh, so, so, so when you put things in perspective, understanding that is, is, is very key. What does that mean to the placement of General Flynn? General Flynn, generals report to the commander in chief. That's mm -hmm. the protocol. And uh, so therefore Flynn reports to Trump. He also, I contend, reports to Juan. Now that dovetails with my understanding of who Juan really is, which is at least at a general or higher level, I've been told with back channel information. And I've also uh, been told, uh, uh, you know, just flat out that he is, he's not only above a general level, but he is um, vice president of the Republic right now. Okay. So we've got, Trump is the, as the president commander in chief and Juan is actually the VP. So uh, that doesn't get talked about much out there in the, in the milieu, but um, this is my understanding. And I've had it um, verified by certain sources. So I, these are things that I feel that I know. These are not things I'm guessing at. Okay. Um, now, um, I guess I hope I answered that question. Yeah, there was two parts of the contention where Flynn uh, fell in all this, uh, where Juan Osama is in all this. And to some extent, there's a few people in the chat saying, hey, Mike Gill is right to be upset. And, and I agree, like we're all long in the tooth and we want things to move along. And to that point, we agree. But I think maybe you can expand on this here too, uh, Carrie. Uh, you were kind of trying to get to it in that interview, suggesting that sometimes in order to take down uh, – a bad organization you have to infiltrate and you also have to act accordingly in order to infiltrate that organization and that might be viewed by people who don't see the bigger picture as well that person is dirty explain that perhaps here in the context of not just flynn but trump also a lot of people are bitching at him for operation warp speed so put that also into context for the audience okay so understanding the spy world which is really what the, the white hat organization is part of and understanding the games they play, which is the deep state games and the white hat games. And they're both using similar techniques. Okay. Because spycraft is spycraft and this is what you do. So one of the things that the white hats have been doing is basically going over to the dark side and sending in um, individuals that they trust such as General Flynn, on missions to deceive the dark side, even temporarily, and to also find what we call, uh, what I call defectors. So they're looking for whistleblowers or defectors, whichever term you like, uh, to come into their midst to give them information about the operations of the dark side, the plans, and so on. You can understand in a time of war, this is critical information, okay? And we are in a war. Yeah. So this is how they must operate. They operate behind the lines, behind enemy lines, if you will. 
We were fighting the Nazis then. We're fighting them now, in case you haven't realized. <laughs> yeah. And they never went away. OK, they took over our space program to some degree. And that whole story I've put out there, um, along with William Tompkins and other whistleblowers over time. So what we're really looking at are levels of secret governments and secret operations. So it's all operating in, under the cloak of sec secrecy. And they're also using certain um, law of war, uh, not the manual, but the, um, the um, art of war. Mm -hmm. By Sun Tzu, for example, is a constant reference to, to that text. And they're using an artificial intelligence to also strategize the best way to win this war, as is the deep state. So both sides are using artificial intelligence and both sides are using methods of deception. I mean, this should be like, you know, this is basically spy 101, all right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, if you watch spy movies, you understand this. You can have, in fact, it was very interesting because recently Juan O'Savin talked about I, I, th I think he's his Admiral Rogers. I'm not sure he's an Admiral, what his actual title was, but Rogers, who was head of the NSA when Trump went into office or um, before when he was winning in 2016, I think it was. He basically knocked on the door of the White Hats is how it was put um, and told the White Hats, showed proof that the, the dark side had been spying on Trump and his campaign since the beginning. And so that was, he's, uh, Rogers is the head of the NSA and that he had climbed to the top of the organization, which was a rather dark sided organization, you know, an intelligence organization spying on all of us, of course, um, and has, has actually brought that organization over to, if you will, at least some of them to, to the White Hats in, in so doing. So when you understand he was talking about how this individual had spent, you know, probably 20, 30, maybe even 40 years of his life pretending to be a bad guy when in reality he was a spy and he got to the head to, to become the head of the NSA. Right. So this is the kind of thing that, that people have to understand. Right. I also talk about Juan O'Savin himself, JFK Jr., and Trump, why they're best friends, why that's documented, and why they both grew up at the feet, as I call it, of the Illuminati, learning all their tricks of the trade, and then eventually turned against them with a plan. And that plan is, is sometimes known as the Q plan, the White Hat plan. And this was to take back not just our country, but the world from the way it's turning, which is towards a totalitarian, um, top-down, hierarchical uh, control um, organism that wants to under, you know, with Klaus Schwab, <laughs> arguably as its leader, God mm -hmm. forbid, um, uh, basically a, a totalitarian government that would uh, track and trace you in every way that would be run probably by an AI that's then orchestrated by them and probably some off world entities as well. So and, and just, so, just so you know, guys, Carrie's just not taking, <laughs> she's not just saying this out of her own. Carl Schwab himself talks about this in the great reset. <laughs> I mean, this is all public knowledge at this point. It's not tinfoil headers. Yeah. So we are fighting and, and the white hats are fighting a most fully entrenched enemy that actually in some ways we have been fighting for eons mm -hmm. but they have decided that they were going to uh, be the ones to change this trajectory mm -hmm. and in fact again as i've said many times they put together their organization although arguably before the assassination of Pre president john f kennedy they were totally inspired by the life and work of john f kennedy and hence this is where his son, JFK Jr., bonding with Trump and leading, in essence, leading the White Hats and the rest of us out of the woods and into the light. This is what we're talking about, okay? You may not think they're going to make it. You may not think they have, you know, you might think they've been taken over along the way. Um, I was just recently on a show where I was talking about, there is a video out there showing Trump's history 
with Adelson and this one and that one and having uh, converted to Judaism and so on and so forth. The fact is you have to understand what they will do, the links they will go in order to be successful in, in, in fighting the dark side. Mm -hmm. And in some ways it's quite understandable as far as I'm concerned. So when Trump does whatever he does, keep in mind that you have to look to the heart of the person. And that is actually the challenge, I, th I would say, at this time, that, that people are not going to be, you can take all the information you get, you can add it all up, and you can still come to the wrong conclusion. Right. You, have you to take do them. not see through to the heart of the person. Right. Right. And this is really where everything rests. And yeah. you need to be able to use your, what they call second sight, you know, your psychic third eye, and so on and so forth, to really, in a sense, grok what's happening and mm -hmm. who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. And your life may, may depend on these decisions. Mm -hmm. So um, so I suggest that you take it seriously and you, you think hard, long and hard. Mm -hmm. But if you just want to look at what you call factoids, that is not going to reveal the true nature of why they do what they do. Because a lot of times they are perfectly willing to look like the bad guy while they're the good guy in reality. Okay. Right. And, and this is a key to how they operate. Right. And that's why uh, those of us uh, with the rebel gene are so dangerous to this uh, cabal. Guys, I encourage you to go uh, check out this book. Uh, uh, I interviewed uh, Carrie uh, on the book about two years ago on my other YouTube channel. It's still there available for you guys. Uh, and it ties in, of course, to the conversation we're having here today. Uh, Carrie, you mentioned Trump being CIC, uh, restoring the Republic. Um, and to some extent, I'm with you on all of that. I've seen some of the moves and I can kind of um, glean, I guess, uh, all of these pieces and, and, and build a bigger tableau. And I think most of our audience would be there also on that page with you. But the question remains now, and I think it goes to maybe my Gil's frustration is, when the fuck are we going to learn this for the truth? Because right now we sit in this weird cognitive uh, dissonance, um, uncomfortable spot. Even the, the patriots are getting long in the tooth and are suggesting that you know maybe something needs to be done. We're heading in now to uh, a year of election. We see this huge like uh, constitutional debate now. Trump is on the ballot, off the ballot, whether it's Colorado or Maine or <laughs> every other state here moving forward. When do we get to that aha moment? Are you talking to some whistleblowers right now? Do you have a feel to how that might come out because in the um one of the web data reports from last year uh suggested that at some point the SOC, which is what cliff High calls it the self-organizing collective but he's talking about the white hats essentially do or forced somehow to come into the open and then kind of harmonize with the rest of us here the people who are holding the line not knowing really that there's this organization in the back of, uh, of the things really uh, playing things out how do you see that rapprochement or that coming out into the open here of the white hats for 2024 carry. Okay. Well, it's interesting because since Mike Gill came forward right around the same time, Juan has started to reveal a bit more, but he's doing it in his usual way. Well, most people don't cannot possibly listen to a one or two hour interview with him where he goes on and on and on with telling stories and so on and so forth. So I have, you know, sometimes I just don't listen anymore but I have been listening lately, the last few um, days, you might say, some of his most recent shows. Yeah. And I have some interesting information that I gathered from that. And I did post it on my Telegram. So if you go back and just scroll up on my Telegram, you'll see some of my commentary that does concern this. But I've got a little more right now. Okay, that let's, I share that with the audience. To the extent, uh, let's share that to the, uh, with the audience to the extent that you can. Right. Uh, well, okay, so, um, and I, you know, okay, so right this minute, I hope I can find it here. <clears throat> uh, okay, where did it go? Okay, so this is what Juan said on a video. And again, these videos I have linked whenever I try to quote him. Uh, you know, paraphrase him and so on. Uh, I do put everything on my Telegram channel. So um, it's 24 minutes and 13 seconds in. He says very clearly we have two presidents and that he was also referring to a psychic called Kim 
Clement, I believe, who passed on a few years ago, but had done a prediction of the future of America and said one day people are going to be walking around talking about the fact that we have two presidents. He said, mm -hmm. we're now there. So this is unequivocal. Juan is stating this very clearly. We have two presidents. And uh, basically, if you have a society that is walking around, he said in the next few months is how he, he put it, Juan put it, that people will begin having discussions among their families is how he put it. Uh, about the fact that we have two presidents. What does that mean? That means that somehow in the next two to three or four months, whatever it is, that things are going to develop to such an extent where average people, not people like me who have whistleblowers and in, intel, but the average person on the street is going to realize that we have two presidents. And this gets back to the fact of are we a U.S. corporation or are we a now a republic? Did Trump, in fact, which he did, there's paperwork to substantiate it, dissolve the corporation right. while he was still in office? And is Trump, in fact, which can which they should have brought forward as far as I was concerned, right after, you know, before Biden was sworn in, as you know, yeah. basically. But yeah. they decided not to do so, it is my understanding because they felt there would be civil war in our country. How, now think about that. Okay, so the, we have generals, there are several generals loyal to Trump. When yeah. they make a decision, they consult the generals, they consult uh, the AI, all right? And then they're putting these things together and they're making a decision. So this is how it's done. Mm -hmm. Now, Jan, uh, December 18th, when Trump decided not to sign the Insurrection Act, a lot of people don't realize what that would have done is declare that Biden and his show, the Biden administration, was conducting an insurrection against our current government, which was Trump. OK, yeah. so that would have exposed these uh, invaders, in essence, which is actually as the head of all of the intelligence agencies, John Radcliffe. Uh, yeah, I believe his report yeah. has said unequivocally, he even said to the other intelligence agencies and when the report was due, he his con conclusion was that the CCP and possibly others. Yeah. At that point, Congress was supposed to take at least 10 days, according to what Juan says and according to the Brunson uh, case that's before the courts as well was supposed to take a traditional, there's actually a provision made for this kind of thing. And they were supposed to take time and analyze the situation and they refused to do so. They refused yeah. to review the evidence and they refused to investigate. Now they are all, all those people who refuse to investigate, all those Congress people are basically traitors. Mm -hmm. And I think that eventually they will be tried as such. So right. you can appreciate why they're so afraid to have Trump win again right? <laughs> uh, or get into office no matter how he does it. Right. Because once he does, the military tribunals will start operating and they, these people will be brought not before probably the Department of Justice as it's currently composed, but before military tribunals and tried and convicted of treason against the United States. What happens to them at that point, I don't know. I don't know whether there'll be a blanket, um, you know, uh, they'll hang them off. <laughs> I, don't, I, you know, I really don't know what they're going to try decide to do. But these people are, they don't just, they're not just uh, talking politics here. Mm -hmm. These people are very serious Democrats because they know their necks are literally on the line. Yeah. Anyone who was a traitor is yeah. going to be called up for it. And we have a lot of evidence against these people. Yeah. Can I ask you, I, I want to take a quick sidebar here too. <clears throat> I understand the concept that at that time, uh, I think the consensus was that if that information had been brought out the way you're explaining it now. So on one hand, we had this dog and pony show to some extent of 
contesting the election. And now here we are a couple of years later, <clears throat> Giuliani here ordered to pay $148 million in damages for defaming the Georgia election workers. Do you think that Giuliani here knew that he was playing this role <laughs> and that maybe he was being set up to fail, so to speak, to eventually be vindicated? What do you think his role is in all of this? And how is this being portrayed now in this, I guess, waking up process over the last couple of years? What do you think? Well, I, I think that, you know, a lot of these players that have kind of looked um, dark at one minute and light the other, again, are playing these roles yeah. on behalf of the White Hats. I think, yes, uh, Giuliani is, uh, you know, he's a lawyer going way back. He's, uh, he's, he's someone that was very involved, if you remember, in 9-11, for example. That too. And way before that with the racketeering cases against the mafia, et cetera. So, oh, yeah. so this guy is not naive in, no. on any level. Yeah. However, it does appear that he's had some contentious issues with Trump and the White Hats. Uh, how far that extends, whether some of this is just, again, an act, you know, to paint him in such a way that he would be approachable by the dark side so that he, they could learn more information about how the dark side operates mm -hmm. uh, when they try to take somebody over or bring them over to their side and so and so. Um, but I can say that any of these things, I think Sidney Powell, the same thing. She's playing a double role right now. Um, this seems to be a modus of operandi for the White Hats and for the people that in all likelihood may be, you know, if, if the act, you know, if the curtain comes up and they actually take their bows, they will take their bows for having played both sides on behalf of the White Hats right. uh, in, in this war, um, you know, to save our country and our world. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do want to continue back with this information about two presidents. Okay. Because I think this this cannot be underestimated. So in essence, uh, we're talking about a, um, I've got, a, I, sorry, while I look at this, um, he says, he was then asked whether there'd be a four year, you know, ele an election. He said a phrase, which is kind of interesting. He said, it's not just another four year election. Um, and that we are right on the edge of what is in essence real action being taken. Um, there is also, there has, he has dropped hints. So this is what he likes to do. He likes to drop hints in the context of, you know, religious stories and historical stories. And then he tells you some bits and pieces that you need to pay attention to. Right. One of the things he said um, is that, very shortly. And I, my understanding is, again, it looks like maybe we're talking weeks, maybe we're talking a few months. There is going to be an incident, a crisis in which Trump is going to have to step forward as commander in chief in order to save the day for America. At that time, it will be widely known that we have two presidents. It will have to be, he won't be just coming forward as commander in chief. I think it'll be revealed that he's also president. So when, now this is the interesting thing about all this. Americans seem to be confused and in the dark, but I bet you, judging from the way the rest of the world acts, that they know damn well that Trump is president. He never stepped down. He's continued as president and he is commander in chief. I think they have no confusion about that whatsoever. Other world leaders, I'm just saying, mm -hmm. so kind of take that on board. Um, it's very important to understand that the White Hats have a mode of operating. He does not like this kind of secret world and apparently is being, I believe he's being fed information and possibly from a dark side source or a source that appears to be on the light, but isn't, um, which is causing him to kind of go out, out on a limb and say, you know, General Flynn's going to run against Trump and there's a plot against Trump and this and that. Right. And he He's going to fuck him over at the last minute, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he doesn't, he, you know, I've given him the evidence. I, I actually revealed even more evidence recently showing, you know, Juan in his, his disguise, which, Anyone with half a brain would notice this as a disguise. Now, if you don't want to say it's JFK Jr., you could say someone else is wearing that disguise, fine. 
but it is a disguise. That's unequivocal. Mm -hmm. And so you've got this Santa Claus stomach, you've got these fat puffed out cheeks, you've got, you know, these fat hands. It, it, it's laughable, really. Right. Um, and it's laughable to me that most people never recognize this. And I've met him in person several times and had long conversations and short conversations as well, um, <laughs> face to face, as well as on the phone, as well as on text. Yeah. So when you look at the situation again, Robert Kennedy is not going to go against his, um, I think, I don't know what their relationship is. Something like nephew, John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh -huh. You understand? Uh -huh. And Trump, he's, he's going to be on the same team. He will be running, uh, you might say running interference or or however you want to look at it in the election. And, and you know, this is, has a precedent. There are often uh, s candidates that would garner a smaller vote that will sort of get into the running and then actually at the end toss all their votes over to whatever is the leading candidate uh, in their view, mm -hmm. right? So, so that is arguably what RFK is doing in my opinion. Um, so I don't buy this idea that that um, Flynn is running. Now, I don't, I mean, I believe that Flynn probably wanted to be president at some point, but keep in mind, why is Flynn even where he is today? That is because Trump rescued him yeah, from, him pardon. from yeah. jail yeah. and that he owes him a huge debt. Now, mm -hmm. remember that when Trump does a deal with somebody, there's always two sides to that deal. So Trump would yeah. have demanded yeah. his loyalty in exchange for getting him out of jail. You've yeah. got to realize what a serious arrangement that is yeah. and, and maybe rethink your understanding of who uh, General Flynn is. Now, I, I have heard General Flynn make statements that I absolutely do not agree with. And I've also noticed that he seems to be to the far right of the even the fundamental Christians, okay? Right. <laughs> so I, I do not agree with his politics or his religion, mm -hmm. but I can say that I believe he is having to be, just to save his own life and his family, he has to align himself with Trump. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no way Trump is backing down. In fact, he's doing the opposite. He's coming to the fore. And everything Juan has said in the last two or three interviews, if you want to go back and look, and they're all listed on my Telegram, yep. those particular interviews, is to say that Trump is going to be revealed as, as who he really is. Yeah. Let me just, uh, so for the audience members, I just brought uh, Kerry's uh, Project Camelot a Telegram link in the live chat for you guys if you want to go follow uh, Kerry there and find those interviews and her commentary on that. And I also want to bring this link uh, down to the chat also for you guys here um, with respect to who Juan Osavin is here in some of these uh, disguises. So there you go. That's in the live uh, chat now. Uh, Kerry, I want to get maybe a little bit more precision on this event that could maybe force Trump's hand to come out into the public here as a CIC. Um, in December, so let me see if I can get the right date here, December 23rd, this was from the latest uh, WebBot data scraping from Cliff High, and I asked him permission if I could read this out loud um, on the show the other day, and he said yes. So he, uh, as of December 23rd, he said that the WebBot data was suggesting that in 58 days from now, so somewhere around the 18th of February, there would be an incident that it would act as a spark and we would get bullets flying. Basically, things get moving really, really fast. And he, think, he thinks that it goes off in Texas, or at least in the southern hemisphere here of the United States. And he says, get your shit ready. But he says, I don't think the SOC will be able to gain, regain control. That leaves the door here to perhaps Trump having or forcing somebody's hand here to make some type of announcement here to get this all back under control. Do, have you heard anything else about first week, second week of February, how that might tie in what's happening at the border? Perhaps this is why he's pointing at Texas for some reason here with all these uh, um, military age fighting men coming in here as um, refugees into the States. How does that tie in in your view? Are you getting any pings on that at all? Uh, no, to be honest with you. Um, I will say that I, I have a sort of a theory that I've been kicking around that alludes to something that Juan said in an interview quite a while ago, sometime this year, I think it was, 
and what it was he was talking about. And one thing he said was that China was putting missiles in Cuba, mm. China, not Russia. Okay. But we are in an interesting um, sort of um, a review of the past We're we're actually, it seems in, it, we're, we're back fighting the Nazis. We seem to be going through some kind of groundhog day <laughs> <laughs> on planet earth. Yeah. Where a lot of these things that have already come around once are coming again around again. It is possible. It occurs to me. And I actually just put um, like a day ago, a link to a Netflix movie that I think people would find very interesting, uh, which is on again, my telegram. And it's only like a day or two ago. And it has a picture of Kennedy and um, actually right now I'm forgetting the name of it. So I have to look at it to find the name. But anyway, it's it's a movie that's very well done. It's a lot of fun to watch, but it shows it's all in the backdrop of the Cuban Missile Crisis and a chess player who's over in Russia, you know, actually in Warsaw uh, playing a, a Russian and the and the kinds of uh, intelligence games that were going on behind the scenes and things like that. It's, it's quite fascinating. The bottom line with what I'm trying to say here is that I have felt that this was not an idle comment, that China putting missiles in Cuba is tantamount to, to baiting us the same way that they feel we're baiting them by putting uh, ships along uh, Taiwan's coast. Right. Okay. Uh, not now, but a few months ago, he was talking about that constantly. Now we have other extenuating circumstances that are going on right now that have to do with, you know, the open border. And if you've seen some of these videos where we actually have throngs of people that are headed towards the United States coming up from Central and South America in through Mexico and in across our borders that are, I guess, unimpeded in any way. And that this looks actually kind of like hordes of people, terrifying. Uh, I have no idea if, you know, what's going to happen there. I do mm -hmm. know that in 2016, there were hordes of people coming through the border or coming against the border when Trump was going into office and that they were all mind controlled, a lot of them by what we call the greys. Okay. And I know one never wants to go there, but there is a huge... Um, you know, we are fighting the gray ETs as well as some other negatively based ETs. And they do factor in in some of the um, incidents and the stories that we're dealing with here. And when you completely ignore them, then you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle. But That's nonetheless, really when so you're, you're talking about some type of um, army of Manchurian candidates, so to speak, controlled here by the Greys. Or... Yes, and, okay. and some of them, they're all, I mean, there are millions coming in. It's a mixture of population as it was in 2016, mm. but it seems like it's even worse. And at this point, they have actually targeted and seen that these are military, a lot of them are military aged young men and they are, um, some are, are Chinese troops, actual Chinese special forces, I think they were called. Mm -hmm. And this is a general, general who, who did a podcast a while ago mm -hmm. on this subject. So we, so this is to be taken seriously. And, and I, and I, I take it seriously because um, several years ago, I had a dream of just that. I had a dream that the Chinese were invading through our Southern border. And in fact, that's what's happening. When I had that dream, I thought it was insane <laughs> mm -hmm. that it couldn't possibly happen. How could that happen? And in my dream, the words come came to me that they let them in. That's what I was told in my dream. And in, and in fact, that's the case. They have let them in. So this is what we're talking. The Biden administration has let them in and the White Hats has stood by and allowed that to happen, which this is, is, this is where someone like Mike Gill can't hold these two ideas in his head at the same time because they're contradictory. How is it that Trump and the White Hats can stand by and allow the dark to do its worst, okay, and to be taking down our border when they're supposed to be fighting against it and so on and so forth? And again, you have to 
for, for understanding this, you have to go back to not only uh, the Art of War book by Sun Tzu, but you also have to understand the thinking of the White Hats, how they keep their enemies, their friends close, but their enemies closer. Mm-hmm. Now, this has been an operating sort of a modus operandi for the whole administration going back way before 2016. And that this is something that they have been taught to do, instructed to do, maybe by the AI, in fact. Um, In essence, telling you that if you let the dark simply dig itself into a deeper and deeper hole, that the dark will, in essence, um, run out of juice. And and that's Mm -hmm. the thinking. Whether it's accurate, (laughs) <laughs> is another matter. All right. right. So, right. Um, so I understand where Mike's coming from with good reason. Uh, he is a person who kind of wants to call a spade a spade, no matter what. Um, but there are some problems and I was trying to, there's a lot it. of nuance and gray areas. It's not black or white. Like that's exactly. the issue here. Yeah. But I also want to get back to this Brendan O'Connell, Australian journalist who is now calling Mike out in essence And he is saying, whether he's wrong or right, I don't know. But he is saying that Mike Gill is actually already on the FBI witness protection plan. And that Mike Gill is not bringing forward his own information. That it's not the White Hats that are stopping him. It's not Trump that's stopping him. It's actually the FBI and Mike Gill working collusion because the FBI are implicated in the in this, uh, you know, in the details of the information he has, which mm. is part of what's called a background to what's called the Pandora Papers, which has to do with offshore accounts and, and all the nefarious things, fentanyl, sale of fentanyl on, in our country, et cetera, et cetera. It's even being manufactured in, in New Hampshire. The data has come out and so on. So. What I wonder about is, again, here's a person who started out as a friend of Mike's, it sounded like, I think, and now has turned against him because he feels that Mike isn't living up to his, you know, stated image of being a whistleblower who has information because he's he himself is sitting on the information to protect the FBI. Now, this is a weird twist, and Mm -hmm. I can't attest to whether it's true or false on Mike's part. I have I'm trying to going to try to get a hold of Mike. I only found out about this earlier this morning, but I can say that it, you know, one of the things that happens when you go into witness protection is that you can't go out and start giving the data to the world. Right. You're in witness protection and they're protecting you on this sort of, there's some, some kind of, um, I don't know, quid pro quo. It's a quid pro quo, yeah. There's an exchange, yeah. Yeah, they hold on to your information until such time as they deem it uh, necessary to bring forward. Yeah. So whether this is true or not, I don't know. But I do know that Brendan O'Connell is actually making a big deal, accusing Mike Gill of certain things. And uh, that's one of them. So it, it, I put that, I also put that video on my Telegram. You know, I put videos that I don't agree with, right? Mm-hmm. Or I may f- find questionable on my Telegram. And then I'll make some comments and so on and ask people to look deeper because it's very important that we at least gather the information. Whether have adult conversations about what possibly is happening. You know, I'm not a journalist who is going to only be prejudiced to one side. I'm going to look at the data and then evaluate and use my intuition, use my prior witness testimony, which goes back 20 years. Yeah. consult with witnesses if I have any in the background, so-and-so, in order to vet information. Mm-hmm. Very good. Uh, I'm with you on that. And it, it, I just want to say to the audience members, like, it gets complicated. <laughs> and I know and I know that for a lot of us, too, we're just hoping um, to be able to walk on solid planks again. And I think over the last couple of years, all of these solid planks have been removed, and we have to keep um, revisiting our understanding of the worldview. And I understand why that's difficult it's difficult for me and it's difficult for audience members and 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 it appears to be difficult for mike gill also he's just trying to get to like as you say but a lot of this is still in the world of nuances and i think 
perhaps that's why it's difficult still to understand. So uh, buyer beware, use your own intuition here. I think Kerry's giving good advice. This is one of the videos here. Um, uh, this is on the crypto viewing YouTube channel. Dick Algar was talking about this particular event here. Uh, this could be what's happening or what could be happening at the um, between uh, Cuba and perhaps uh, the Americas where this starts over. They have another one. Um, and I don't think it's published yet, uh, and I don't have the image here, but we were going back and forth in emails a couple of days ago uh, where we saw this uh, mushroom cloud, so to speak. And I think they believed it was in the United States. So that now ties into maybe what Juan was saying and how you just uh, brought that back into the equation here. So again, guys, go check it out, futureforecastinggroup.com uh, uh, if you're interested in all of that. There's a lot of information there. Uh, Jenny, let's, uh, Gary, let's go back to the ETs controlling part of this war and i think this is a tough subject matter for a lot of people especially maybe some of the new bees or the normies waking up to all of this are like okay jc i was with you with all the financial stuff and the, the ponzi scheme but now you're, it's a bridge too far jc you're talking about ets again and so in the last couple of weeks i've been running this series um Angels and the Great Deception Exposed. A lot of it having to do with Mauro Bellino's book, The Naked Bible, some of the mistranslations, uh, some of the obfuscations that suggest, as uh, Paul Wallace is suggesting in his book here too, that we are a species uh, with amnesia having to do with paleo contact. And he's talking about this ET race here um, that has been essentially messing with us, as Kira was saying here, for maybe thousands of years. So uh, I'm going to have uh, Paul Wallace on here on January 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be a fabulous show here, a continuation of this particular series. But that's where I wanted to go with you here today, too, on the Elohim front. Um, so let's go back to some of the Twitter posts here. So U.S. Space Command reaches full operational capability. Uh, this was on December 18 that it was announced. And then a couple of days later, Shadow of Ezra was suggesting that Donald Trump, of course, had created the Space Force and that this force had no ties to the previous administrations. I think that's an important part. Now, you, Kerry, you've done a lot of work in the last couple of years, and I asked you before the show to bring this back into the context here. Uh, the Black Power Projects and Follow the Money. You and I did an interview on this in uh, 2021, but that suggests here that there's part of what Trump was doing with the Space Force, which was maybe putting on the books what was previously off the books, where all of this money is going for. But in terms of this overarching issue of what's happening on the planet in this war right now, to some extent, we just had that first layer conversation of all the obfuscation, the spy games and all that, which makes it very complicated, yes, but now we're going to make it even more complicated to the audience members and suggest that, whoa, 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 we are not in an enclosed system. So yes, there's those spy games, but on top of that now, we have major interference uh, coming up, um, call them the Elohim, call them the Anunnakis, the Greys, all of these characters here that have a specific agenda for humanity. So let's get into that. I saw a video... This was two weeks ago from Tucker Carlson. Let me see if I can bring that one up on the screen for you guys as well. Um, maybe we can play it, uh, Kerry. It's about a two-minute clip. I want to show this with the audience members if they haven't heard it, and uh, then we'll start the conversation over from there, okay? Okay. I'll cut it there, but you guys get the drift there. But essentially, they're getting into uh, or speculating the dark parts here that uh, Tucker doesn't want to talk about is perhaps the contracts that a lot of our power elites around the world, our militaries, our governments have concluded with some of these off-worlders, in some cases, maybe in exchange for technology, which we would presume would be a good thing for the evolution of humanity, but in some other cases could be the exchange of uh, adrenochrome farm products. Uh, that was a big part of his administration. And at some point, if we are made to understand that this planet is basically a farm for some of these ETs if we're disrupting the flow of the product of this farm <laughs> to whoever controls this particular area of space, they might be coming back and they might not be too happy about it. And so maybe that's what's going on here with the Space Force. Maybe that's what's being slowly introduced here into the narrative, the mainstream news narrative now of Tucker Carlson on X. How, Carrie, let's, let's dive into this a little bit here tying in the farm products on the planet, those people were off world and how all that ties into this war we're fighting now, which is a much bigger uh, concept than just the spy games uh, between the different uh, sovereign countries, Gary. Okay, well, I mean, I don't know how you look at me, but um, in many ways I'm considered something of an expert on the topic. 
So uh, I have spent 20 years interviewing whistleblowers with above top secret clearances. And uh, one of my primary witnesses uh, over the last, um, I don't know, seven years or so is Captain Mark Richards. And he is in prison in Solano prison in California. Um, I've gone to the prison in person to interview him in person, taking notes. I, I'm not allowed to have an audio copy mm. of our discussions. But he is someone who has his father was working in the secret space program, as well as his grandfather, who was uh, a famous uh, Air Force officer called the Dutchman. And Mark and his, um, I guess it was his father at the time, were um, flew into the Dulce base, which is in New Mexico, to rescue a number of humans that were underground in this space being kept as, uh, in cages. And they did so. What Mark tells me, however, is that a couple weeks later, the Greys went and got them again. This is not a piece of the story that normally makes it out to the mainstream or right. even to the alternative. Yeah. So why that's going on? Understanding that ET races, according to also Ashiana Dean, for example, who's written the two Voyager books, who goes into a long history of humanity's interactions with various incoming ET races, some of whom do not have our best interests at heart, who have want to use us as genetic um, resources to genetic and genetically engineer us and other ET races to mix the races into a super race, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some of that gets into all the secret space program and, and all the things that I've talked about over the years. Right. And so it's very important, I think. I mean, I think these books are absolute required reading yeah. equal to the Bible, if not better because they tell a history of humanity, which is mind blowing. And yeah. it starts even off this planet, but definitely on the planet and goes back eons. So what we're really talking about is also something you haven't mentioned, which is the e every spacefaring nation, according to Captain Mark Richards, creates an AI so that all of the various ET races some of whom are way older than our civilization, have created AI. And those some of those civilizations have, but the AIs live on. And Minerva is one such craft that travels around the solar systems and basically ended up being on um, off Earth. And, and Mark made contact with her and was the only, the only human for quite some time who was able to actually fly her. And she, he had a relationship with this, a, this ET um, AI called Minerva. And I have um, basically five, uh, let's see, five years of 12 interviews mm. with that I, in which I call them total recall because I had to recall everything we discussed and then put it into I have notes for every interview and I have um, an interview in which I, I go through all the material on screen and I also am compiling all of this into a book. So that's one aspect of talking about what you're bringing up here. So it is a big subject. I also have numerous whistleblowers, including Bob Dean, okay, who talked about the Anunnaki walking the halls of the Pentagon, for example. Yeah. And I have a more recent whistleblower called Major Solomon Berg, who talked about have this um, Sasquatch from the Pacific Northwest that was captured by the Air Force, that this scientist called Major Solomon Berg was hired because of his ability to communicate telepathically, first of all, with animals, but secondly, as it happened with the Sasquatch. He developed a very deep relationship with the Sasquatch and the rest of his members in their community, which is a sort of a, a network of, of telepathic communication, even off planet. At any rate, that's a saga and well worth. I did three interviews with him before he disappeared. And arguably, I've been told. I don't think he did. I hope he's you, just, you think he went dark. I think he went into, uh, yes, into hiding. 
Um, I, I pray that he has, because he no. was a really genuinely delightful man. You watch the videos, you'll find out why. Yeah. Um, so what I'm saying here is that... And, if, and the story about the Sasquatch, uh, their relationship with humans over time, too, is absolutely fascinating, and it needs to come out more. Like, we have all these shows on TLC, but they kind of make a joke of it and like of it, but right. it's really important to understand our history and all this. But keep going. Absolutely. And it's it's also a good entree to understanding any ET race and how we might interact in a good way or a bad way with that race. And one yeah. of the things that came to light was um, he actually took the Sasquatch, he and his team rescued the Sasquatch from within the military prison underground where they were keeping him and it. Um, it ended up to be called the ambassador. I kind of named it because I said he was an ambassador and they liked that name. So they called it an ambassador. So the Squatch and, and Major Solomon Berg went over to Israel in hiding from the United States military that was trying to experiment too much on it. Mm. While they were in hiding in Israel, it came forward that the Squatches going back in history had a very bad history, a histor historical relationship with the Anunnaki who run Israel. And I've talked about this for years. I've been talking about this. Yeah. Most people completely ignore me when I talk about this, but I actually interviewed at one point an Israeli journalist called Barry Shamish. He's not alive anymore, but I got in touch with him and we had an interview. I think it was a radio interview. I don't even know if I still have you know, have evidence because people did break in and steal and, and remove our interviews at one point. But at any rate, what happened was he was an Israeli mainstream journalist who started hearing stories about housewives in Israel who were seeing these very tall beings, humanoid looking, that would come into their houses in the middle of the day. I know it sounds incredible. But they would walk into the houses, they would kick the dogs or whatever out of the way, they would look around as if they owned it, and then they would walk out and leave. Those stories started to proliferate at a certain point in Israel. And he, this journalist started investigating to see if, if it was true. What year were these events happening or started to be reported, uh, Carrie, just to put that in the timeline? Do you remember? I'm sorry? What year were these events where these tall beings? Oh, I, I don't remember. Um, okay. You know, it might have been in the 80s. I mean, first of okay. all, it's been many years since I even talked to him and he's right. passed on. Okay. But, you know, I've been doing this for close to 20 years now. So it's sometime <laughs> in theory, it, it, it happened during the last 20 years okay. in theory. But okay. I don't even know. You know, okay. I, I can't. No, fair enough. I was bringing that up. It's just in the context of the uh, Israeli space chief just coming out a little while ago last year, talking about uh, how Trump knew about all this uh, yeah, uh, contract yeah. with extra. I mean, all of this innovation. is look. I mean, the stuff that we have been trying to disclose in Project Camelot yeah. is coming out slowly. You know, Grush and the whole UAP uh, congressional sort yeah. of uh, meeting or whatever you want to call that. Um, that was all part of it is, is starting to disclose the exact same thing as we have been doing for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So um, what what I'm not sure if there's a really specific question. This is definitely a backdrop. And I, I will say just as a sidelight that uh, one of the, the provocative things my, Mark Richards has said to me is that certain historical incidents that we think we've been told are our history and that they happened in a certain way actually involved ETs. And one of those incidents is the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. So we're, and, and by the way, the ET AI, it came from the Greys. And the Greys are instrumental in trying to take over not only our bodies, but the Earth. And we are going to battle with them. And even the White Hats are probably bi battling them in underground bases. Now they feed on this, uh, the, it's called louche. It's a, a slang term for it, mm -hmm. but basically the um, excretions from our various uh, organs and, and glands. And uh, ultimately there's a, a further development of that, which involves what I call the adrenochrome highway. And that involved Hollywood and it, it, it's a horrific story and 
these are the kinds of things that the two people, Tucker and this, the other um, person, did not want to reveal to the public. They say they can't handle it. But the fact of the matter is, whenever somebody tells you you can't handle something, you have to understand that this is exactly what you're going to have to do. You're going right. to have to handle the truth. Yeah. Unlike Jack Nicholson, who says you can't handle the truth. I right. fully believe humans can handle the truth. Keep right. in mind that we ourselves are, are genetic hybrids of ETs. Right. Therefore, in our deep memory, contrary to what people will tell you, is that we are part of a race of beings that comes originally probably from Lyra. The Lyra system is where humans and humanoids are said to have originated, but it could go back further than that, of course. What I'm saying here is that you're not telling us something we don't know. In essence, most of the things that we talk to each other about, even Cliff High will tell you, is that we're highly psychic and we're also precogs. Yeah. In other words, we see the future. Humans, he based his entire web bot, his entire, you know, um, way predictive of linguistics, making yeah. money of his entire, yeah. you know, scientific, ex, you know, expertise, yeah. whatever, on this idea that humans basically see the future. Yeah. So we know who we are on a deep level. All we are doing is awakening people who have forgotten who they are. Right. Um, going back a little bit deeper on the question of um, maybe this, uh, the uh, the farmers <laughs> in terms of this particular farm here on the planet and what they're up to. I wanted to bring this up because you say we can't handle the truth. And I agree with you. We need to go through this whole process. That's the first part in us healing ourselves, our past history, and then maybe wrestling control of our own evolution. And as you mentioned, the adrenochrome network. We can't talk about that without talking about this, what's on the screen now. And so for the last number of years, um, I think you and I talked about this perhaps on the first interview in my show a couple of years ago, we were on this trajectory towards the disclosure of this information where we ultimately get to the adrenochrome um, and networks and how a lot of that is not just for Earth, but is also going off planet. Now, we were treated with the Weinsteins, you know, with the actors and the casting couch, and then we had the teenager stuff, and then eventually we started talking about the young people here, which is what's about to get out. There was a judge just ruled uh, in December that these um, Epstein uh, associate lists would come out, and um, people were suggesting in the shows a couple of days ago, yes, not just Epstein, like this, there's a big network here that's perhaps just a piece of the puzzle here. They're pointing at uh, uh, Richard Branson and uh, yes. Virgin uh, Galactic, his mm -hmm. island, and how he was probably catering to an even higher class of humans and maybe off-worlders as well. We can get into all of that. But it appears we're here now, and this was funny yesterday. I saw uh, Bill Clinton coming out acting very uh, frail, and I said, oh, look, it's the old Sicilian flu <laughs> strategy. I think they're all going to get sick and disappear here as this list is supposed to come out now it was supposed to come out yesterday and then uh we understood that there's a petition and this was interesting uh, uh carrie a petition for a john doe and then it, it says jane doe but it's it's actually a jane doe here uh number 107 on the list of people supposedly being disclosed here uh who's asking to have their name obfuscated from this particular um disclosure uh, because their life might be in danger here uh, in the united states you guys can go and read that in so where does that tie in like and how close are we to getting into the adrenochrome network and then the off-world thing if we're just now starting finally to, to talk about this epstein list where do you see that and how do you see that transpire here perhaps in the next couple of weeks and months carrie what would be the timeline okay this actually gets to the heart of the matter of disclosure because again if mike gill is being accused of withholding information because the fbi who would be revealed their names in, in the data, the FBI are holding back the information. By yeah. the same token, my understanding is that this list is being cleansed by a judge who is being prevailed upon to remove certain names from the list to protect not only um, maybe parties that weren't actually as guilty as that may look. In other words, they're there on the plane they're there because they got roped in. They're doing business, but they're not actually complicit in the and act. Some might be victims also. There was yes. that also attack. Yeah. And, and thereby um, force, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, but the other thing is also that uh, that that what has gone on there is um, is is that this is a honeypot situation that that Epstein was running for the CIA, <laughs> by the way. And, and Mossad, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. and and these these are reasons why they don't want the the real list out there. So when you look at that, you're looking at a situation where there are so many people implicated in one way or another in this data that wants to come out. But we are living in a time where the secrets are going to come out. So they may try to withhold this information a little longer. I don't know if it'll work. I do know that um, WikiLeaks was very helpful in releasing a lot of information Certainly Hillary Clinton, Clinton yeah. and, the, and the Clintons are very heavily yeah. um, implicated. I'm sure, you know, Obama and that whole gang and the Bidens and so and so. So in other words, we're talking about <clears throat> and I, I talked about this on a prior show where I actually talked about how do you do business when you hate the person you're doing business with, but you want to make money or you have an objective you know, to further yourself through doing business with the enemy, so to speak. This is something that Trump is an expert at, and he has learned to negotiate those waters very well. But I can say that this is something that people have to cop to, okay? That whether you understand it or not, this is what goes on on our, on our planet. We are not able to separate ourselves out from all of the dark siders and live in some, you know, uh, isolated community where no one touches us and no one threatens us or any of that. We live in a melting pot of, of individuals and races and ETs and so on. And eventually all of this will be very well revealed. And, and these decisions will have to be made, but they'll be made in making deals, compromising, leaving some on the table for the other guy and so on and so forth. We are living among vampires. We are living among, I mean, we are prey to us to a certain species. Now think about why would that be? Why would God, and I know all these people out there just like to talk about their God and all this kind of thing. And why would God set up a universe, a multiverse in which humans were prey, which we definitely are to very CT races. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand that what is what happens when you, you know, to a, a, let's say, um, a, 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 what do they call, you know, whatever you say, um, to a bunch of cattle when they're being stalked by lions, okay? The ones that are old and crippled and, um, and too young to survive get attacked. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the, the um, why is this word escaping me? The herd? The herd? The herd, yes. Yeah. The herd gets uh, gets basically Cold. thinned, Cold. Yeah. and Cold. and you get forced to um, to fight for yourself. It it raises the bar of survival, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of things that we encounter here as humans on Earth are doing that right now. Mm -hmm. They are forcing us. This is part of them, by the way. The ascension process is to. It was growth through the contention. Yes. The, the protagonist, uh, the antagonist needing the protagonist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that it is actually is structured into the universe, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And that if you do have an opponent, you have an enemy, it, it may, forces you to become bigger, better, smarter and survive. Yeah. Otherwise, you perish. So yeah. this is, you know, the essence of the story that we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. And the, we have many obstacles to overcome, but we are going to surmount these obstacles. What's built into us, it, our superpowers are part of that, you know, mm -hmm. the undiscovered superpowers that humans have, that most are in denial over, are going to be coming more and more to the surface. The rebel gene. <laughs> Go back to the book. Uh, Carrie, what a fabulous interview today. Thank you so much for taking the time. There's a lot of comments out there uh, on the chat today, thanking me also for having you on, having you uh, 
uh, able to speak a little bit and share some of your thoughts here on that past interview. A lot of people were frustrated with that, trying to get a little bit more clarity. So I think we've achieved our goal here today. So thank you so much, everyone, for watching. There's 8,300 and so watching here on Rumble and about another 1,000 or so here on Twitter. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Kerry, before we go, anything else going into the interview today you thought was important to share that maybe we haven't covered? One and two, uh, anything uh, coming up also here on Project Camelot uh, Portal com that you want to point the attention of the audience to here moving forward for 2024. Okay. Well, I do just uh, want to say to people that on my website, I publish all the interviews I do and all the people who interview me, I try to get a copy and put it on there as well. I use my rumble channel and you'll see across the top here, I've got all my social media where I post things. Um, I will say that the YouTube probably doesn't always work that link because I've been banned from YouTube several times. Um, I can't even watch shows if they know who I am. They don't even let me watch YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> they have no, they, I'm like, you know, persona non grata over there. But I have a bit shoot channel with plenty of, of my interviews as well. I have thousands. So there's arguably, you know, 2000 or more interviews either with me or I interview someone else. Um, so this is just huge, you know, it's a huge library of work. Um, I do encourage people to, to, to actually, you know, try to watch as much as you can, because I find almost every single interview I've ever done to be valuable and mm -hmm. to help under, you know, people to understand the, even where we are now. And um, I have to say that none of my stuff is out of date, <laughs> if anything, um, things it's kind of coming into its own right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it's really kind of, um, it's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating line of work. You know, I work very hard. I still, I'm still hard at it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what can I say? Please support me. Um, you know, $3 a month to join my channel. It's not a lot. <laughs> Uh, to say but the it least. makes a big difference when people come and support you on mass, yeah. so guys. Again, uh, Project uh, Camelot uh, Portal dot com. Uh, Carrie, before we go, um, and I kind of did this on the show last night here, looking into twenty twenty four. There is a lot of chaos moving around, and judging by the conversation you had with uh, uh, Wano and what he's seen coming up, what some of the remote viewers are coming up, there are going to be a lot of challenges. But through those challenges, perhaps for the people who are well informed and who have done the work. There may be also some great opportunities for them as well. Speak about that here, words of encouragement, maybe words of advice here to seek those opportunities, to seek those silver linings here through all of this chaos and why it's so important for us individually and collectively as a human race. Carrie. Okay. Uh, well, I would say, again, as I was kind of starting to say, that these challenges ultimately are refining our race, are preparing you to do what is often called ascend and understand the higher realms and that turning away or hiding your head in the sand is not going to work at this time mm -hmm. and that we have a tremendous amount of energy coming into our solar system uh arguably merging with the sagittarius galaxy from what i understand and also energy from possibly the galactic center that is actually a wave of energy that is bringing all things to light. And when you understand that, that's working to our benefit. Now, if you are somebody who has done dark deeds, you know, you might want to think about um, exposing your own dark deeds, for example, and clearing your conscience. But this is a, an incredible opportunity, I would say, for everyone to you know, to come to terms with what it means to be human, why it's so important to love each other and support each other and also employ, if you're such a person who believes in Christ, for example, forgiveness is one of the hallmarks of his teachings. Mm -hmm. And this is something worth noting that he was always trying to bring on board sinners and considering saving a sinner to be uh, one of the highest uh, sort of notes in, 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 in his trajectory. So we want to rescue each other, in essence, and we want to rescue our children. So let's stay together during this fight. You know, if you're on the good side, 
bickering and calling names and all of this, this is not going to work. It, it's useless, first of all, and it reflects on the person doing it. So it doesn't reflect on the person you're attacking, by the way. Right. It just rolls off. It, mm -hmm. it, it's meaningless. But it's really, really a reflection on who you are. So if you spend your time doing that, when you could be learning, refining and raising your vibration on your frequency, then you are going to be the loser at the end of the game. So I, I, I just want to encourage people to uh, sort of get a get sort of from a higher level, get the bigger picture and understand that there are good hearted people working on your behalf. If you don't want to call them white hats, if you want to call them something else, I can assure you that not every single person in our military is part of the communist CCP takeover of our government. Hmm. There are military men and women, and there are agents in all the agencies, including the FBI, by the way, and people good. There are good souls everywhere. And I meet them every day. And, and I, I know this to be true. And so stand with them, thank them, you know, in your heart and in your prayers and support them because they need all the help they can get. Right. And, you know, let's let's stick with the fight. Let's stand together at this very crucial time. Let's save the United States from these invaders and let's save the rest of the world. I love it. That's a mic drop moment right there, Carrie. I'll do a sound bite of that. I love it. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here today. Please leave us a comment. Let us know what your takeaway is from this interview, perhaps what you want us to follow up on on the next uh, War Correspondent Special Report. Please give us a like and, of course, share this video uh, with your friends and family and help us, of course, uh, bring the awareness of all of this uh, crazy, crazy stuff happening in our realm so that people can join the fight, so to speak, as Carrie was just saying there, so that we can all uh, stand together. In the meantime, also, if you want to support Carrie, please do go and check out on Amazon.com uh, her book, The Rebel Gene. Fabulous book also ties into a lot of the conversation here uh, with respect to what's happened to humanity uh, and where we're going with all of this. And the silver linings, of course, here of having that rebel gene and um, supporting uh, humanity here through this process. So a big thank you to you, Carrie. And again, guys, you can find her work at projectcamlotportal.com. I'm Jean-Claude Abion Mystic, and this was the special report here with Carrie Cassidy on January 3rd of 2024 i love you guys have a great day and we'll see you again this evening at eight o'clock for the uh, new edition of the 2024 beyond the news take care guys and we'll see you soon au revoir